So long, dental plan! Dental plan! Lisa needs braces! 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 Bullseye! Something tells me I've been dreaming of someone who was there for real. It seems I chased a thousand ways. I wish I looked the way I feel. Ding! Stop playing with me. What niggas know about gray space, son? So, you may not have heard, but I recently lost a game of 2K. It was pretty close, I'm not gonna lie. The bet was, if I lost, I'd have to do a video on Nickelodeon's As Told by Ginger. Some may think I took an L, but, uh, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Hide the money, y'all. There's poor people around. <laughs> With your broke ass. <laughs> I got a lot of comments after that video came out of people wanted me to review the Canadian-made animated series Brace Face from 2001, which aired on Disney Channel. I take it that people closely associate the two. I'm definitely guilty of that. Honestly, you can see why at first glance. Teenage girl, boyfriends, green grass, it's a whole vibe. After Ginger was over, I was admittedly hungry for more animated shows like that. It really put in perspective for me how important these kind of cartoons are and how fun it is to watch them and grow with the characters. Plus, I, I don't know if y'all know this, but it's like crazy easy to access this show, my G. It's all on Tubi, son. Why does nobody talk about how lit Tubi is? You can damn near find anything up there. Fucking got high and watched Mad George and Martha. I love Tubi, son. This isn't a Tubi ad, by the way, they ain't paying me. But this is an ad for Skillshare. Skillshare is an online, <laughs> it's like, nah. If the streets want brace face, I'll give the streets brace face. So here I am, finally doing this video in this October, 2019. Uh, okay. Well, I moved some things around. Uh, let's go for March. Fucking hell. Alright, let's do April. Can I? May? Fuck! July? How about, how about now? Can I do it in August? God, damn. Works for me. <sighs> Brace yourselves, y'all. What Canadian-made TV cartoon stars a blonde teenage girl and her circle of friends who are trying to make their way in the landscape that is teenage life? 30 seconds, go! Oh, I know this! Oh, me too, me too! Uh, it's... it's... Uh, I can see her! Oh my god! Sharon has got braces? <laughs> If I were you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is too hard. That's probably why it's worth doing. Uh, okay. So I wrote this video in August, or the first half, rather. So it's kind of dated, and it, it it shows. So remember that joke from a good minute ago? Yeah. Today's video actually is brought to you by Skillshare. Okay, okay. Ah! Just, just play the light by common. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different classes covering dozens of different creative topics, all taught by well-versed professionals. Premium membership gives you unlimited access, so you can join whatever classes or communities you feel like are right for you. Whether you want to fuel your curiosity, creativity, or even your career, Skillshare is honestly the best place for you to go to continue to develop whatever your craft is. There's classes on poster design, animation, writing, but if you're into art and don't know how to use Procreate like I don't, I recommend Vashti Harrison's Illustrating in Procreate, Drawing a Shareable Time Lapse. Really teaches the essentials of understanding Procreate, how it works, and sharing your art in an interesting way. And be better than me, son. I don't even think I can draw anymore call a hospital. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. We're a little short. Hell. For a limited time, use the link in the description to get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity without having to put the bag up. Just go to Skillshare.com slash Tumor Victorique 6. 
skillshare.com slash T-O-O-N-R-I-F-I-C-T-A-R-I-Q-6 for two months completely free. Brace Face is about Sharon Spitz, a 14-year-old going through everyday life with her best friends, Maria and Connor. Her mom pops in one day and says, yo, getting braces tomorrow. She's like, huh? What kind of dentist office is this where the guy is working on three kids' teeth at the same time? There has to be some kind of sanitation laws against this or something. Don't touch me after digging in that nigga's mouth. He looks like he eats chalk. There's a thunderstorm while the procedure's being done and Sharon's braces get electrocuted. So now her braces kind of have powers? What is this, like a superhero origin? What can she even do with those powers? Ah! We fall down, but we get up. Now the braces are only really used to expose characters to certain things other characters said or heard that they may not have known otherwise. Like one time Sharon leaves Alden a voicemail and the braces act up so the voicemail ends up getting on Brock's phone. Or Nina has a confession on a tape recorder so the braces expose that. It's just kind of a narrative cheat, I'm not gonna lie. In a literal sense, that's all they do for the plot. But thematically they're used to tie into Sharon's life. How it's new, not secured in one spot, her life is consistently changing, like any teenager. There's just some new things that she can't shake that ultimately contribute to her insecurities and she has to learn from consistently. That's what the show's about and the braces personify that. The whole popularity thing is important to her like any show in the 2000s and they definitely clown her for her braces. They gotta stop stunting son, she don't even look that bad. You broke my camera. Ah, shit, come on, son. Aside from the static shock braces thing, which isn't even a big functioning aspect of the show, Braceface is a show solely based around its cast and their relationships. I think the show does a really good job at this, too. One thing I found admirable about the show was that, aside from a handful of episodes at the end of the run, everything that happens to these characters matters. It doesn't even matter how small it is. Have you ever tried yoga? I've always wanted to. You should. It promotes flexibility and relieves stress. Yoga breath, Sharon. You're the one who taught me that. Josh? Are you all right? I want that one. Here, you were really good in the play. That has been something that I've always respected about these kind of cartoons. I guess these slice of life cartoons really carry this reputation that these things don't really happen to these characters. They always either seem to revert back to normal next week or only remember select things. You think in something like Rugrats, the parents would learn to keep a tighter grasp on their kids after they got lost in the woods or they control fucking mechs around Paris during a wedding, but no, no one learns anything. They even let them get lost in the woods again, son. No, none of this shit mean anything. I don't think this makes one better than the other, but I do think it's nice to sit down and watch something and go, hey, these are real people with real boyfriends, real teenage, real complicated life. So Brace Space ran for three seasons, and within those seasons, they gave us a lot of characters. I already mentioned Sharon, but there's our other two best friends, Maria and Connor. Sharon overreacts to a lot of things, but it's always grounded because her friends always look at her like she's complaining about nothing, because she usually is. They really are the level-headed voices of reason that keep this show afloat for most of its run. Maria more so than Connor, but we'll get to that. Alden is Sharon's crush and soon boyfriend in the show, who has a band mangled metal with his best friend Brock. Sharon and Alden actually get together really soon in the show, I was surprised. They just ripped that band-aid right off, huh? I respect it. At least he doesn't Steve Urkel her and not give her the time of day until around the end of the series when he's about to fucking die in space. How the fuck did I get on Family Matters, son? This was that weird era where cartoons kept over-sexualizing teenagers on some Kim Possible shit. The shit kinda nasty, son, I'm not gonna lie. Look at this nigga all day, why I keep drawing this nigga like this? This is a young boy. A young white boy. I think I'm calling the cops. Of course you can't have one of these early 2000s shows about high school without the popular girl that wants the main character dead for pretty much no damn reason to be honest. I mean, there's a reason, it just 
makes me roll my eyes. That's Nina here. They give her a little henchman named Allison who I pretty much ignored for the first half of the series but then she ended up having my favorite arc in the whole show. So Connor almost fucking dies one day and her dad being a firefighter saves him. They chop it up and start dating and remain that way for the whole show. She deadass cuts Nina off, realizing how bad of a person she is, apologizes to Sharon and Maria for everything, and she's like a fourth member of the squad. That's what I mean when I say that I just, I admire that everything matters here. <laughs> and she says this, I know I played this clip already, but I can't get over the fact that somebody actually said this in this show. Don't worry, she'll let you know. I'd brace myself if I were you. <laughs> so... I definitely want to go in about these characters deeper and their relationships like I always do. But this time, it's different. This time, I brought somebody to do it for me. Everybody, please welcome Offbeat Kiki. Uh, I'm over here. Well, there isn't enough money in the budget to film this twice. Somebody save me from Sharon Spitz's good intentions. It took me 15 episodes before I was able to write anything at all about Sharon because this girl really does not know who she is at the beginning of the show. I hate to say it, but when you consider all of the choices she makes, Sharon's not really a good person. Her actions are typically defined by her desire for attention, popularity, and boys. I think she suffers from anxiety, which leads to her overthinking basically every situation in her life, especially when it comes to relationships. Well, have you ever had that dream where you're standing in front of the whole class and you suddenly realize you're naked and there's nothing you can do about it? That's how I was feeling, like a naked idiot, and this close to having an anxiety attack. Correction, attack was well underway. Must get out of here. Sharon's ego makes her act poorly on so many occasions. When she gets to high school, she's assigned a mentor named Dion, who's a talented, aspiring fashion designer. He's very insightful and supportive and individualistic. But unfortunately, unlike in the real world, those traits make him uncool in their high school. And so Sharon pushes him away initially and even steals a dress he spent months making in order to gain the approval of Alden's nasty mentor, Evie. And then there's the time she had the balls to act like she should get to make any of the decisions about how her mother spent the family's money just because her mom told her no to a ski trip. Just because you're the mom? You get to decide what we do with all our money? Yes! That clip was pretty loud. Shouldn't you level your audio? We don't do that here. Her expectations tend to be unrealistic. One time she fully expected to pass a test without studying, and when she went to summer camp, she expected Alden to write her every single day. I know she's only 13 in the first season, but she's pretty gullible. At one point, she racks up $500 on her family's phone bill by calling a phony psychic, fully believing that the psychic's predictions about everything in her life are true. That includes the test that she thought she would pass. There are a few instances where I felt Sharon completely abandoned her morals for something that wasn't worth it. Like the time she almost cheated on Alden with a camp counselor and told him that Alden was just her cousin instead of her boyfriend. Girl, what? Something I admire about Sharon and one of her only consistently redeeming qualities is her passion for animal rights. Sharon is vegetarian throughout the entire show. At one point, she rescues live frogs that are supposed to be used for a dissection lesson, and even though she gets suspended from school, she doesn't regret it at all. She breaks into a snow sports apparel company to convince them to stop using fur. She sneaks into a cosmetics company and finds out about their animal testing, and then tells everyone she can about it, even leading a protest with Brock. She actually enacts change several times in the show, which I thought was pretty cool. After getting suspended for releasing the frogs, she finds out that future students will have a choice between a computer program and real life dissections. The Snow Sports Apparel Company actually did stop using fur in their products, and the cosmetics company stopped animal testing. And now I'm making it seem like Sharon's all bad, but at her core, she's an immature and well-intentioned teenage girl just trying to find her way. And there are some moments where she redeems herself. There's an episode where she's assigned understudying Nina in a play, and Nina gets superstitious and doesn't want to go on. But even though Nina has relentlessly bullied her for years, Sharon gives up her opportunity to perform and convinces Nina to go on. In another episode, 
Sharon rights a wrong by helping a neighborhood woman keep her 23 cats after getting animal control called on her. And that's the thing. The good things Sharon does are almost always in order to fix a problem that she caused. I know it's because the show was trying to share a moral or a lesson every episode, but it definitely had an effect on her characterization and my perception of her throughout the show. Sharon goes through a lot and learns from every situation, but I think the problem is, is that she still reacts to every new thing the exact same way. Everything she does is really selfish and self-destructive. It's all really based in insecurity. Something will make her feel subconscious and she'll end up doing the one thing a normal fucking human being wouldn't do. Maria and Kanika say, Hey, you're overreacting. What? Why don't you guys understand me? You don't know anything about me! Who was that guy? I think everyone's aware of this except Sharon. I hate that they have this clip show really late into the show's run where they show Sharon talking about her experiences to this young girl who's on her way to get braces and they make it seem like Sharon has grown so much but she's still a bad person. Sharon's not a static character but she really never stops being selfish. The hell wrong with you? You ain't high and mighty, brace face. You can't tell nobody how to live their life. My mom's a therapist. She always says Bad times are an opportunity to grow. Man, she didn't even say that shit, son. Then you must have grown a lot. Cap. <laughs> <laughs> now with the album out, are you paying attention? Even when Sharon tries to do the right thing, except for all of the animal rights stuff, it's either all for selfish reasons or she's just jumping to conclusions. A lot of Sharon's problems wouldn't even exist if she just spoke to people or maybe minded her business. Instead, she gets involved in so many things because she's so scared that people feel the way that she feels. She does a lot of things out of spite too. One that's super fresh in my memory is when she breaks up Nina and Griffin, who's pretty much like her stepbrother, only because she doesn't like Nina. She thinks Nina's going to break Griffin's heart, but you think she learned by this point in the series? Hey, that relationship that you have with someone, it may be bad, but that doesn't mean that's the relationship someone else would have with that person. Also, your bangs kind of look like a headband. Take that fucking jean jacket off, it's 85 degrees. Boy, this was the stupidest, most nauseating thing I've ever done. <laughs> you sure about that? It's strange though, because I don't feel like this comes off as making Sharon a bad character. She's just written in a fashion that makes her come off as very stubborn. That's where the frustration comes in. It's more for her as a person instead of the way that the show is written. I think what saves her is that she does reflect when she needs to. And she does try to do the right thing, albeit in her own way. Side note, she keeps... They always have her sitting on the roof with her pets when she's really down on her life. Huh. Face ass. This some kind of white girl thing? I ain't never seen some shit like this out here. It's like in the 90s where they have like boys climb up to their girl homie's window. Well, you better get the fuck away from my daughter window before you end up on GoFundMe. Tch. Let Carissa explain that shit. The hell wrong with you? Sharon, get them fucking dogs off the roof. You can't tell me what to do. I have braces. Fuck. She's got a good point. Just real quick, I want to touch on Sharon's family. Not physically though, that's gross. I like Sharon's mom, but she's kind of a pushover. Like, your daughter's a piece of shit. Why do you let her do half of the things that she does? Sharon has a younger brother, Josh, who's a child prodigy. Really good at playing the piano. And he's voiced by a young Michael Sarah. Like, really? It's Michael Sarah, son. He's Scott Pilgrim. He got a pee meter. He's in... Lesbians! Here we meet Sharon's older brother, Adam. Adam? What are you doing? Whoa! This nigga Adam is so big! Pause. Look at every shot he's in, he can't even fit. Pause. And he eats a lot of meat! Play. 
Nami! Sharon's parents are divorced. While her mother Helen is consistently present throughout the show and maintains a balance of supportiveness and assertiveness, her father Richard is a musician who is constantly on the road and taking weird gigs, which leads him to be less present, especially in the first half of the show. We saw this evident in the episode 14 Candles, where Sharon's father got her a doll for her 14th birthday, despite the fact that she had stopped playing with dolls a long time ago. Sharon definitely had a reaction when her parents got significant others, but by the end of the show, she seemed to have a healthy relationship with both of her parents and their partners. I really appreciated the time and attention that the show put into Sharon's relationship with her parents. It gave a lot of depth to her backstory and characterization, and it was refreshing to see from a time in cartoons when parents were virtually non-existent. Kind of reminds me of As Told by Ginger, but comparing the two is a video for another time. Don't you think so, Tariq? Wait, huh? Wait, did you just... Holy shit, did you just address me? You know, we wrote all of our sections for this video, like, separate from one another, so I'd like... I genuinely, um, I wasn't, I genuinely wasn't prepared for this. Uh... Yeah. No, sure. We'll do that sometime. Yo, how long is this video? Do you have any idea what you look like hip-hopping? Maria Wong is Sharon's best friend. She loves sports, has a custom dad-built case full of trophies. Can't relate to the trophies or having a dad. She manages Alden and Brock's band, Mangled Metal, and she has a tendency to overreact and make untrue assumptions about what people think of her. She also tends to drop all responsibility and morality in the face of potential popularity. Maria makes some weird choices and a lot of them get Sharon in trouble. When Maria pressures Sharon into wearing her mom's new diamond earrings and Sharon loses one of them, Maria then pressures Sharon into stealing a replacement using the five finger discount and they get into a shitload of trouble. Maria also encouraged Sharon to lie about her life on a reality show because Sharon winning the contest would increase her popularity as well. My least favorite choice Maria made was thinking she was in a relationship with one of her teachers. When Sharon tries to talk some sense into her, she freaks out on her and denies it. Thankfully, that episode pulled a bait and switch and when the teacher asked Maria to a restaurant, it was actually about forming an academic group and not for something way worse. Maria also seems to know when to take a stand for her own beliefs. I also liked the storyline where Maria joined the boys hockey team despite the sexist coach. And in that episode I mentioned where Sharon is fighting against a snow sports apparel company using fur in their designs, that company actually comes up because they want to sponsor Maria. Sharon tries to convince her to drop the sponsorship, but Maria asserts to her that it's important to her and that she can't just call it off because of Sharon's beliefs. I wish Maria could have had a plotline around her that didn't involve her teaching Sharon how to steal being in love with her teacher, and letting a jerky, manipulative boyfriend walk all over her. She seemed like so much more than that, but her actions didn't paint her well, and when I was younger, Maria was one of the only characters who looked like me on television, so seeing her painted this way is kind of upsetting to me as an adult. Maria was a personal favorite of mine, since she always did seem like she had a good head on her shoulders, and gave some of the best lines of dialogue. You look awesome! No way they're gonna ask for your ID! I look like a drag queen! Whoa, shit! <laughs> but admittedly, as the show went on, we saw more and more of her character flaws. Which, I do think is fine, just sometimes she could be a bit more selfish than usual, or leap head on into a more judgmental attitude, but I don't know. Admittedly, this stuff is pretty scattered. Especially for someone who's best friends with a really bad person. I ain't letting that shit go. No! Shit, but y'all wanna see what a fucking goat looks like? Don't you get it, Sharon? Making you feel less than is big business. The worse you feel about yourself, the more products you'll buy to feel better. Connor McKenzie is a genuinely nice guy and a good friend to Sharon and Maria. When he gets screen time, he's typically saying some woke shit about how capitalism sucks, calling Sharon out on her shitty behavior, or helping someone. Connor's relationship with his girlfriend, Allison, is what catalyzes him being in the show more often. They're very supportive of each other, and she even jumps to help him when his allergies act up instead of acting grossed out, which is something he's historically struggled with when dating. I liked that once they got together, they stayed together throughout the show. Something that stuck out to me was the way that in the episode's second thoughts, when Brock is having a bad time, Connor doesn't mind listening to him and discussing his problems, 
despite the two of them rarely interacting one-on-one -on -one like that elsewhere in the show. And in that Snow Sports Apparel episode, after Maria says she wants to take the sponsorship, Connor actually takes her to an animal advocacy center to show her why Sharon cares about animal rights so much, so he was instrumental in that company stopping using fur. Connor's just a good guy because he can be. He has no ulterior motives, he's just a good friend. This nigga Connor is golden! He's literally the only character in the show that has done nothing wrong, like ever. His intentions are always grossly pure, and he tries his hardest to tell everyone when they're overreacting or doing the wrong thing. Shit, early on in the series, my boy Connor had a black queen on deck for a little bit. Okay, young buck, I see your work. Wow, look how she separates whites from darks. Whoa! So, when the show starts, literally the second episode deconstructs the whole, oh, are they gonna make the two best friends date thing? They kind of patch that idea away from the start, so you're not stuck wondering what kind of show this is. After that, though, they kind of forget he exists. The weird thing about Braceface is that you'll go spills without seeing some of the characters. There's big ass sections without Brock, Josh, Alden. There's an episode where Sharon's left home alone and Josh goes missing and shit and Adam's nowhere to be found and they don't even explain any of that. Connor's damn near written out of the series sometime. This nigga becomes a background character a few episodes in the season 3. There's episodes where major things happen and I just remember yelling, fam where the fuck is he? Like Kiki said though, like once he starts dating Allison, he's used more often. But I kinda do hate that that's all they made his character out to be. And it's fucked up because when he is around, he's so good. There's this episode where him and Sharon get into a really big fight because she shows the homies his meat. Is that really a meat? Pause. There's this part where him and Sharon lock eyes with each other through the telescopes and there's like no dialogue. It's brilliant. It blew my mind when I first saw it. I get if everyone listened to everything that he said, there'd be no conflict. And I also get not wanting to write a character whose entire stick is nobody's listening to me. It's just, <laughs> when you give us such a well-rounded character, we're definitely going to miss him when he's not around, especially if you don't let him be himself, for better or for worse. Thanks, Jims. Should I thank Jims? Yes. When Sharon, Connor, and Maria are all together, it's typically more about Sharon's problems than anything else whether that's getting her to study or her relationship issues. Maria pokes fun at Sharon a lot, and Connor typically chimes in as the voice of reason. Sadly, Connor and Maria's friendship seems to mostly be due to them both being Sharon's best friends. Altogether, they're a good trio, and I wish we had seen more of just the three of them having adventures together. When it comes to Sharon and Maria, I'm not sure they really have a healthy friendship. As we talked about earlier, Maria pressures Sharon a lot with bad advice throughout the show. There's an episode where Sharon and Maria go to summer camp they've attended for the past six summers, and Sharon gets a surprise opportunity to be a counselor in training. Sharon gets a real big head about it, and then it gets them both in a lot of trouble. Turns out the whole time, they were both just worried that the other was more mature than them or about to drop the friendship. But Maria redeems the situation by helping Sharon get another shot at being a counselor. Sharon had some weird expectations for Maria. When Maria gets sponsored by that snow apparel company that uses animal fur, she says it's one of the coolest things that's ever happened to her. But Sharon gets super offended that Maria doesn't hold the same animal rights values. Maria ends up hijacking the company's fashion show to announce them switching to faux fur, which forces the company to actually do that. Have you noticed a trend here yet? It's always Maria doing the thing that fixes the situation between the two of them. It's never Sharon. Connor is really the only true good influence on Sharon amongst her classmates of the same year. He's a really good friend to Sharon, consistently throughout the entire show. He's always reminding her of 
of what's really important in life and dropping knowledge on her. I love the episode where he took her to a meadow and they rolled down a hill together to enjoy just a simple thing. It was really wholesome and sweet. When Sharon messes up, Connor typically forgives her instantly, but there were two times where Sharon really did Connor dirty and she totally deserved the backlash. Another time, Sharon and Connor got paired up for a science project and Connor wanted to do all the work because Sharon had bad grades in science. Sharon cheats and gets them in trouble, but even after it's all over, Connor assures her that her drawing interpretations of the project still match the real solution. There really is kind of a Mike Lou and Nog thing going on with these three. Like, I could give you some examples of Sharon and Connor, maybe a few of the three of them together in a fucking grocery list of Sharon and Maria. There's times when Maria and Sharon pull up together on their bikes and I'm like, damn, where old boy at? Y'all are terrible friends, go find your homie. They could have took his fucking beetle boots, y'all don't know. Sharon, they took my beetle boots. I low-key hate this nigga Brock every time he's on screen. He be on some like borderline predatorial shit. Yeah. Mm. No pain, no gain. And even when he's not doing that, he's just so cocky and desperate and loud. And he's wrong about everything. Remember kids, the only thing worse than being wrong is being loud and wrong. They got this nigga doing the monkey pose, man. She she envisions this nigga as a fucking dog. My third eye was open the whole time I was watching this shit, son. <laughs> oh, all that goofy shit. Nice voice actor, bro. How's that treating you? I don't think Brock's like a bad character. He's just a super annoying, borderline bad person. He's like this for most of the run, but he lightens up in the last third of the show. The whole time watching it, I was praying that they wouldn't do the predictable thing and make the two minorities date, but yeah, yeah, no, they definitely do that. What starts with an M and ends in an A, no, it's not my ma, it's Maria. That shit is fucking trash, dog. Get the fuck off the airways. Oh. He dates Maria a bit later, and if you pay attention right before this happens, you can see the writers putting it into overdrive to give him some redeeming qualities. I think it works, though. They complement each other very well, and I respect that you get the sense that he grew up instead of just being morphed around in a writer's room. That monkey pose still ain't cool, though. Who the fuck drew this? Sorry, but Brock Layton is a bad student, he borderline harasses his female classmates, and he's just generally the worst. 2000s kids TV demonized black teenage boys so bad. Nickelodeon did the same thing to Tucker and Danny Phantom. And the only positive example I can think of is Static Shock. Not cool. Brock is essentially a pervy, overconfident idiot for the entire show until he and Maria get together. We find out he likes Maria real early on in the show, but regardless, he hits on every girl he sees until they're dating. He postures like he's got swag, but he embarrasses himself a bit trying to win her favor, showing up for their date on a unicycle and dressed real goofy. Once they get together though, Brock's characterization flips. He puts effort into bonding with Maria's Italian grandparents, he suddenly loves cats, and he even directs a play despite his father disapproving of his interest in theater. He also hosts protests against animal testing in the cosmetics industry, and I didn't see an ulterior motive there. He just agreed with Sharon's cause and wanted to fight for it with her. She's accepting of him how he is, and they seem committed to working on their relationship. In general, I think Maria's relationship with him really helped him become a better person, and I'm glad they gave him some mature characterization later on in the series. So, uh... Let's talk about Phineas and Ferb real quick. Here is cute blind boy with guitar! Here we go! Beautiful, kind and gentle. Alright, so remember Jeremy, Candace's boyfriend? So I never noticed until talking to Rob for the Phineas video, but this nigga pretty much is deprived of any ounce of a personality. He's just cool. That's it, he even keeps the same pose all the time. That's why he looks so gross when he catches the itis and gets attached to Ashley Tisdale. This makes way more sense in context. Alden has just as many personality traits as Jeremy. They're both the same exact flavor of vanilla white boy with a guitar. Except Alden's not as cool as Jeremy, Jeremy got a little swag to him. I know you can easily make these points without attributing them to other animated series, but you know, you've come to the wrong channel if you weren't looking for something tangible. 
Sweet. Alden's characterization consistently surprised me at the beginning of the show. For a 13 year old boy and the love interest of the main character, he's surprisingly thoughtful and openly affectionate with Sharon. But he has his fair share of mistakes. At one point, he straight up tells Sharon that dating is about seeing movies and doing homework together, not supporting each other. And when Sharon goes away to camp and calls him for the first time in a while, he can't be bothered to stop watching sports on TV for five minutes to talk to her, and it causes a bunch of problems. Alden, you seem kind of strange. Oh man, what's with you? Nothing's with me. I'm just really starting to wonder if you're even missing me. <sighs> you gotta be kidding. However, Alden isn't bogged down by societal expectations of male behavior, despite his best friend Brock enforcing those expectations. He votes for Sharon when she's against Brock in a school election, which is directly defying the age-old saying of bros before hoes. He's not embarrassed to be committed to a girlfriend, he doesn't choose the popular girls over his friends when his band is casting backup dancers, and he doesn't mind picking up tampons or nail polish for his sisters at the drugstore. In the camp episode, when he goes to visit Sharon, he's wearing a swimsuit and he gets insecure. And he ties a towel around his waist and it kind of looks like a skirt. And I think that's a cool character note about how Alden doesn't really give a shit about traditional masculinity. I was pretty surprised that Alden actually ended up being one of my favorite characters. Wanna practice tonight? I can't, I'm doing homework with Sharon. Again? This is becoming a nasty habit, man. This and your guy friends for your girlfriend? Ah, uh, you're just mad because you're not going out with anyone. Sharon is kind of ungrateful in her relationship with Alden. And I think a lot of the ways he responds to her shitty attitude are justified. There's an episode where it's Sharon's birthday and no one has planned her a surprise party despite Sharon thinking everyone has. Alden takes her on a date the night before her birthday and buys her a gift that she said she needed, but she's completely ungrateful and Brock convinces Alden to ignore her calls afterward. In the episode where they break up, which is pretty early on in the series, Alden starts avoiding Sharon to hang out with a cheerleader. I thought his behavior towards her was pretty shitty considering Sharon was still his girlfriend. He lost interest in her because of her terrible attitude and behavior. She tries to make it up to him, but he isn't having it. He even says they weren't exclusive, which I thought was really dog shit. While Sharon does her best to bury the hatchet and be a supportive friend to Alden, he starts to catch feelings again around the episode's second thoughts, when Alden is assigned Sharon as a scene partner in theater class, and they have to kiss in their scene. Which, by the way, is creepy as hell and should not be normal for 14 year olds. Like, let them choose not to do it. Alden tells his girlfriend Marlo that he'll fake it, but it's definitely not fake. Can we just talk about this kiss animation though? What were they thinking? Yeah, it looks like they're both trying to pat a spider off each other's back. Yo, I got you. My mistake, big bro. You got something on your shoulder. Right, right, right. As you should. As you should. Despite all of this drama, watching the slow burn of them getting back together was pretty entertaining, and I was really rooting for them. Weirdly enough, they seem to get along better after their breakup, which makes me think that sometimes his friends gave them a better basis to restart their relationship. It's really funny. I don't have any notes about Alden and Sharon's relationship from my time watching this show. I don't think it was handled bad. It just wasn't my biggest investment. I kind of liked them when they were with other people, man. I'm not going to lie. Like Alden and that black girl were super big chilling, bro. They were a whole vibe. And Sharon, you know, she had... Hey, you want to read your notes for Nina? Nina Harper is an aspiring model obsessed with popularity, vanity, and chasing fame. And as a result of this, no one else but her cronies like her. When we get a glimpse of her mom and her family's lifestyle, it's very obvious that Nina's family is rich. Nina's obsession with these superficial things honestly makes her a pretty weird girl. She says that her clothes smell so good she could eat them. She talks about how much popularity matters to her in therapy. She loses her student body president position after using the school budget to buy makeup. And she even insists on any dog she gets being purebred. But she does adopt a rescue eventually. In the first episode of the show, we are introduced to Nina purely as the girl trying to steal Alden away from Sharon, even though they aren't dating yet. She even calls Alden during class to tell him that Sharon can't go with him to the dance and tells him she'll be his date instead. She's just always trying to fuck up Sharon's shit as much as she possibly can. When you consider it for long enough, Nina's obsession with destroying Sharon seems pathological. She makes fun of Sharon for feeling compassion for animals. Oh, look at the poor little froggies. Oh, that's right. D-Day's coming up. Dissection day. 
It's not for everyone, though, especially wimpy whiners who can't take a little gore. She says she wants to see Sharon in detention for the rest of the year and generally does anything she can to make Sharon feel miserable. Then, late in the series, we find out that she holds this vendetta against Sharon because she thinks that Sharon broke a bunch of her dolls when they were kids. And then it turns out that it wasn't even her. As far as I could tell, Nina had no redeeming qualities. Nina is what I was scared Courtney was going to be before I rewatched Ginger. No character, no nuance, just villain. Anytime they make her sympathetic, we don't see too much of it because this show is from Sharon's point of view. Nina is written really superficially. She's the only character that doesn't really feel like an actual human being. It really does make her stick out like a sore thumb in comparison to a cast of characters that change throughout. Even Miranda eased off Ginger after a while. Nina doesn't excite you with her presence. They sometimes even stick her in stories that you probably wouldn't even have to see her in if this wasn't a Saturday morning cartoon that needed an antagonist. And it's fucked because they like played with us. They give Nina some moments of sympathy or redemption, but it's just ripped away in such a status quo -y way. Braceface is not The Simpsons. They don't need to revert character development. I guess this is their way of saying that some people never change, but I don't know. It just comes off kind of gross. In my notes, I have Nina Stinks. So, yeah. Perfect. Man of a Thousand Thoughts has left the chat. I'm glad that Dion Jones was introduced as Sharon's senior mentor when she started high school. It was great to see him act as sort of a moral compass for her throughout the rest of the series. And he was one of the few people who truly held her accountable. He's a fashion designer who makes some interesting and unique pieces and Sharon gets to model them a few times throughout the show. His real name is Mark, but he prefers to go by Dion to honor his idol, Celine Dion. And if that didn't make it obvious, Dion is gay. I thought it was wonderful that Dion being gay wasn't a huge coming out moment or a point of drama. It was just a fact about him, and that was very rare in the age when the show came out. I chalk that up to this being a Canadian show because I don't think that would ever have happened in a kid's show in America. Too many angry parents. Your best friend's a Chinese-Italian mix, Brock's black, and I'm... adorable. fashion in the show is very 90s inspired, so I love that. But I wish the characters could change outfits more often. Sharon and Maria get a new outfit each season and an occasional special look based on the episode, but basically everyone else wears the same thing the entire time. It would make sense if they never aged, but this show spans over three years. You're telling me Brock and Alden never considered a drip upgrade from eighth grade to sophomore year of high school? I noticed that the backgrounds in the show are nicely built from textures. However, the character art looks pretty silly a lot of the time. I noticed the art got a bit more proportionate in the third season. I gotta say, I super loved the edgy, sad music transitions, and I can still hear them in my head. These backgrounds. Oh my, oh my god, these backgrounds. Like, early on in the show's run, I think I'm gonna fucking throw up, Jesus Christ. They look like Garfield PC games from the 90s. Nothing but a bunch of Mad About Cats vibes. I don't own any consoles, but I remember Garfield Mad About Cats. My palette is disgusting, I know. You see what I'm talking about though, right? Man, y'all probably not even looking. I get told all the time that people just listen to my videos instead of looking at like the hours worth of editing. Can you see that? The character art's pretty sharp. A lot of points, a lot of edges, but they don't go too overboard. At least it's not like anything by Butch Hartman. <laughs> The what, bro? It gets a little crazy though, a nigga go wonky out in a minute. But for the most part, it's a solid looking show. The theme song is reminiscent of the Brandy and Mr. Whiskers one, whereas they both use clips from the first maybe five episodes and time them to the music. But there's a little bit more new animation here, which I appreciate. Alright, musicality time, son. I love the first few shots of the intro, they're timed so well. Something tells me I've been dreaming. Sharon flips her hair on beat right before the singer drags out the word never. As someone who was never real. This shot right here is genius, I swear to god. Sharon reaches in, locks eyes with her mom. It seems kiss. I've changed the then we have enough time to see her mom fully react and hold on it until the dog pops out and eats the fruit. Her mom and Adam both react on the eye 
Fam, I could look at this shot all day. There's so much going on. It's so good. It seems I've changed a thousand ways. I wish I boom, 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 boom. Ding. She steps on beat, son. It's so good. I'm gonna throw up. Good vomit. Real classy. Real. A lot of red lobster. <laughs> Sharon's voice actress change in season 3 was pretty jarring for me. In the episode Lucky Break, I had a hard time figuring out whether Sharon was being sarcastic or genuine. And after a few episodes, I felt that the new voice actress was way more tolerable and less grating. She also gave Sharon a bit more maturity. I tried to research why the voice actress change happened, but I couldn't find anything. My braces! I heard some noise and all of a sudden I could hear Adam on the phone with one of his friends! What about the dancers? They must be in incredible physical shape! Let's spend a little time rounding it off and talk about how Braceface handled some of his lessons. It was pretty much the core purpose of the show. Where something like Ginger was more about these characters and what they were going through, Braceface was more about what they learned. They actually do an episode where Sharon gets her period, which was something that I was expecting Ginger to do, but they didn't. So it caught me off guard, which worked because I'm a dumb guy and my reaction was like Alden's. Oh, tee hoo, I love you. Fam, the episode is called The Worst First Date Ever, period. How did I not see this coming? You gonna talk about the boob episode? 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 Ah! Right. Mm. Y'all don't read each other's comments before y'all start emptying these shits out? This shit ran for 70 episodes. Some white boy tell y'all that her boobs grow when y'all go crazy? You wanna talk about it? Of course not. I didn't even really ask you. This is pre-recorded. Just play Eric B and Rock him again. Sharon is insecure about her breast size, so she goes to buy a new bra that inflates, so it makes her chest seem more prominent. It goes wrong, and she learns to love her own body for what it is. That's it, I right? Ain't nothing spectacular. That's why I'm so confused by all of these comments. Hopefully, y'all come away from this video realizing that this show has way more to offer. Also, I know a lot of y'all don't watch the whole video before commenting. So I'm safe to assure that someone referenced it. If you see a comment like that, respond with an L. That'll show them. <coughs> I don't know, man. Some of these lessons, man, they didn't have to... <laughs> okay. So, there's this one where Sharon meets a guy and thinks he's perfect. Then he pulls up to pick her up for a date and her brother's like, Oh, we know this nigga. How come I've never seen you in class? Oh, 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 Pablo doesn't go to the same school as us. I meant your other brother. Oh my god. I mean, when I heard his voice, I definitely thought he sounded like a young bull, but I kind of just shrugged it off. Then they pull up to the date anyway, and then they start playing on the fact that he's young, super thick, G. This shit had me crying. That's not all. I also got suckers that are whistles. How cool is that? Yeah, I used to love them when I was a kid. The moral is supposed to be that Sharon shouldn't care about what people think and look past their small age gap, but I don't know, son. Some of this dialogue, you can't just be slinging this shit around everywhere. I guess I just figured if we liked each other, age wouldn't be important. Wait, you're right. All that matters is that we get along and that we like each other. The show was ambitious with its lessons, and it tackled several difficult topics. Sharon discovers porn on accident, gets in a sticky situation involving drinking at a high school party, and takes a guy's keys, and she gets caught up in disordered eating behaviors. And I think the show did a pretty good job with those. But they fumbled big time when they talked about racism. Yes, this white Canadian cast playing diverse characters really went there. Oh shit, wait, 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 wait. Hold up. I forgot about this one. Play Eric B and Rakim for real this time. So Sharon's grandfather that she hasn't seen in a while comes to visit her. Cool. Maria pulls up with this Muslim guy that she's been dating. He just he just starts to go viral off rip. Cloud? Uh, what kind of name is that? That's just what the guys in the team call me. My real name's Muhammad. Oh, oh, you're an Arab. And when do you get your own camel? Oh boy is kind of playing with it. 
He's kind of letting him have it. But then this nigga kicks it up a notch faster than Phineas and Ferb and Slash. Just make sure you don't lend it to Maria. Why? Well, everyone knows the Chinese are such bad drivers. So now I'm like, oh shit. Maria gets pissed, rightfully so. Here goes Sharon. He was just playing. He loves you people. I bet you he loves Chinese food too. He does. So now they beefing. Sharon's scared that she got the fucking racist gene because of course she finds a way to make everything about her all lives matter head ass. They fucking go bowling and old boy starts being all misogynistic, telling Maria not to use the big bowling balls, interrupting her when she speaks, kissing her in public when she doesn't want him to. So now they're trying to tackle racism and misogyny and I'm learning that I don't know how to spell misogyny. Sharon tries to talk to Maria about it, but now she thinks Sharon's just hating because he's Arab. She presses her grandfather and he just like doubles down. Well, it's true. Then he says some anti-Semitic shit and now she's super mad. This all sounds super deep and normal, but <laughs> wait till you get to the end. Maria breaks up with old boy because she realizes that he's trash. Sharon figures out, oh, I don't like him because he's a piece of shit, not because he's Arab. Lit. She goes to the fucking park and sees her grandfather flying a toy plane with a bunch of mixed kids. Sharon fucking dies. <laughs> then they piece it up and she buys him a damn tofu dog. Tofu, huh? You really think that stuff is healthy? I really do. <laughs> what can it hurt? So really, the lesson here is, yeah, granddad, you could be racist and not could be vegan. We just have a different opinion. She's vegetarian. Whatever. Y'all know this isn't how racism works, right? I wasn't just I wasn't just born on Mars. Being racist is not a difference of opinion or preference like fucking eating meat. What the fuck is this? It's crazy because it starts off really smart and unapologetic, but then they just drop the ball. OD. He doesn't even learn anything. He literally never says Damn, my fault. I was wildin'. He's still racist. Imagine if Brock walked in with that nut ass monkey pose. <laughs> what is this? Some kind of some kind of Negro thing? And the little girl at the end that crashes the plane was Asian, so that pretty much confirms his crack theory that they can't draw. Fuck out of here, man. I'm fed up. Just skip to the finale so we can get the fuck out of here. For context, the finale takes place when Sharon and Alden are broken up, but Alden starts to feel as though he has feelings for her again. They go to camp and he tells Brock about this and he spends the rest of the episode trying to figure out how to tell her. There's a lot of context that I'm leaving out for the sake of simplicity, but this episode pretty much closes with them agreeing to give it another go. This one kind of works as a finale, I guess, since it's something that the show was leaning towards, but really I think it's kind of hollow. It feels like this was one of those safe finales. Like, oh I, we might come back, we might not, who knows. It's fucked up because we're so attached to these characters at this point. I would've just loved the sense of like, finality. I couldn't tell you before, but you look really good in my sweater. Thanks. And for the record, I still think it smells great. figment of my imagination and I don't have to put up with you anymore. That's more like it. I'm in your head now, you fucking jackass. Hey, how come nobody watches your videos anymore? You should just delete your channel like that super hot fire guy did. Look at your views. I watched Brace Face during three distinct periods of my life. The first was during its original airing when I was seven or eight years old. 
I would see the show on TV every once in a while and always felt excited when it was on. The three episodes I remember from back then are Take That, the episode where Maria and Sharon use the five finger discount, The Good Life, when Sharon is in Lena's Rags to Riches music video, and Skin Deep, where Sharon begins disordered eating habits after Nina bullies her. I gotta say that the whole five finger discount thing definitely encouraged me to steal stickers out of a pack of yogurt at the grocery store, but I told my mom and she made me put it back. Rags to riches stayed stuck in my head all these years, and I think I was a little too young to really understand what was going on in Skin Deep. The second time I watched Braceface, I watched it all the way through. I was 16 and completely isolated in a different state from all my friends for the summer. I was still a bit naive, but by that point in my life, I knew what being in a relationship was like. I knew what fighting with my friends was like, and I knew how heartbreak felt. Braceface hit me hard this time. I remember feeling every emotion Sharon felt so profoundly as I watched the show. I was very invested in her relationship with Alden because it felt so deep and relatable to me. As a teenager, Braceface was a show about what I was going through. It was unapologetically feminine, captured the nervous energy I was feeling, and handled a lot of topics that I needed to hear about. As a teenager in the early 2010s, beginning to see the rise of social media and comparing myself to others, that episode Skin Deep about Sharon's crash diet had a much more profound effect on me. Now, I'm 25 years old. I know real adult pain, trauma, loss, joy, and how to find balance in the madness. I watched the show in quarantine, a time that felt like I was in limbo, floating in a gelatinous space outside of time where all I did was work, sleep, and feel sorry for myself. This time, Braceface was a picture of the juxtaposition of feeling like you know everything when you don't really know anything yet. For someone like me who was emotionally stunted as a teenager and sheltered by my parents from so much of the world, that complex cross of maturity and immaturity encapsulated my being. Watching Braceface again invited me to remember and reflect on the times I had previously seen it, and how I've changed and grown as a person. It allowed me to analyze the way I used to think and how I've matured past that previous mindset. And while my thoughts on the show aren't all positive, I'm glad I spent some time revisiting Sharon, Maria, Connor, Alden, Brock, and their friends, and at the same time, that former version of myself that related so deeply to the characters' lives. I don't think I'll be watching Braceface again. I've taken a deep dive into the characters and relationships, and I feel like I've gotten everything I can out of the show, but if you've never had the chance to catch an episode on TV or here on YouTube, I think it's worth giving it a shot. My favorite episodes are The Worst Date Ever, period, Mommy Nearest, and Skin Deep, so try one of those. Braceface is a show about adjusting to femininity, self-acceptance, interpersonal relationships, and trying to figure out how to do what's right. Sharon makes mistakes all the time on her journey to finding herself and becoming a better person, but I think life as a young person is a series of best guesses and mistakes that lead us to who we're going to be as an adult, and this show did its best to depict that. Braceface is not a bad show. Braceface is a good show. It's a really fun show sometimes, it's a really frustrating show sometimes, but I think for what they were trying to do, Braceface was a really important stepping stone to talking about certain things on children's television. It reaches heights that we somehow haven't even caught up with. Braceface is a show about Sharon Spitz and how she lets her insecurities with her appearance dictate her anxiety and how she treats the people around her. She learns to let people live their own lives separate from her. She learns that the world doesn't revolve around her. All of these really important things when you consider the kind of person that Sharon Spitz is. However, I feel like for a show about a girl who gets braces and feels like her entire life is over, but she doesn't learn the most important lesson of all time. The one that would have easily made all of her problems go away. Mom, I'm fat. Oh no. No, honey, you're husky. It says so on your jeans. Mom, I'm fat. But big deal. I don't feel bad about it. You never made me feel bad about it. And just because there are some people in the world who want me to feel bad about it, doesn't mean I have to. So Bobby Hill's fat. <laughs> He's also funny. He's nice. He's got a lot of friends, a girlfriend, 
And if you don't mind, I think I'll go outside right now and squirt her with water. What are you gonna do? I can finally say that I did that damn brace face video. This was a really hard one to put together. Not because I didn't feel like I could do it justice, but more because of the time period of my life that I choose to commit to this show. It's been rough, y'all. That tweet wasn't a joke. I definitely turned down four blunts in a beach strip just to watch some damn Sharon Spitz. That phone conversation was gross, my nigga. It's been really difficult lately, juggling all of these different parts of my life. I appreciate this show for what it is, a story about change and the challenges that your insecurities can cause for you if you let them. That's important. That's super important. Some people struggle with it today. Life gets really hard, but hey, at least we aren't sharing spits. I don't know what's coming up next, but eh, who cares? I'll work it out in the end. Fourteen years ago, your father and I were at the U2 concert. We only got to hear three songs when your mother's water broke. Something tells me I've been dreaming of someone who's never real. Seems I've changed a thousand ways. I wish I looked the way I feel. It's just... Oh, Sharon. I just need a breather. I thought what you and I had, well, I thought it could handle some stuff, but it couldn't. Are you breaking up with me? You are. I just want to be on my own for a while. Keep it simple. We left during Sunday Bloody Sunday. And when you were born... Fourteen hours later... What did I say, Helen? You said, a girl. I always wanted a little girl. You did? You bet. <laughs> My life is complicated. Well, this time it's different. That's all. All right. But you're my girlfriend. And I love you. One song he's like, uh, I can't fuck no fat hole never. And I'm like, never, nigga? <laughs>